to the finest crew in Starfleet. Engage. Watch your bad son. I'm Luke. I'm Captain Captain Janeway of the USS Voyager. Captain Captain Janeway of the USS Voyager. Captain Captain. Welcome to the Greatest Generation. It's a Star Trek podcast by a couple of guys who are just a little bit embarrassed to have a Star Trek podcast. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica. I was buying a bottle of champagne today hmm? because this is a Quarks Bar episode and I needed a bottle of champagne to drink during the episode. And I was running behind. I ran into the store. I grabbed the first bottle that seemed like it wouldn't be bad. And the ladies working the counter were like very impressed with my level of uh, just shoot from the hip, grab the champagne, and take it to the cash register. And they said, wow, what's the occasion? And I didn't want to say I have to drink this for my Star Trek podcast. So I said, oh, it's uh, for a uh, for a rap party. We just finished a big tour. <laughs> Thinking that that would sound cool. Thinking that that wouldn't lead to more questions. The follow-up question is always, yeah. what was the tour? Great. And I was like, it was for, I, it was for my Star Trek podcast. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, yet another grocery store you will be avoiding into the future. <sighs> Could just one time somebody ask that question and I say it's for my Star Trek podcast and they ask if I'm a friend of DeSoto. That's why we invented friend of DeSoto in the first place. How about you just lie, Ben? Just say you like to drink a bottle of champagne in the middle of the week. By yourself. It's basically what this is. I'm looking to get a real Tuesday night drunk on. Yeah. Yeah. A real ice pick style hangover on a Tuesday yeah. before I even go to bed. Indeed. Well, it's also a Code 47 episode, Adam. And we have a bunch of packages here. A bunch of, uh, bunch of verified packages. We hope so. We have a kind of a trust but verify relationship with the Friends of DeSoto these days. Sure. Captain, I'm sorry to disturb you. I'm receiving a code 47. Verify. It is code 47, sir. Start lead emergency frequency. Captain size only. This first one is a little. The lady at the post office, I could tell regretted giving it to me because she said it didn't have enough postage on it. Oh. She took one look at it and she said, that, that doesn't have enough postage on it to, to get to you. And I was like, well. It's here. I have it. <laughs> it's in my hand. And she was like, yeah, I guess so. You're definitely the one that should be scolded. The receiver of the letter. <laughs> As if it's your fault. And I know how deeply you felt the responsibility for that, even though it wasn't your fault. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's just my way. That's mean. Um, yeah, I was... Uh, <laughs> When we were at San Francisco Sketchfest, which is now a few weeks ago as of uh, the release of this, a couple of uh, my suitcases got stolen out of the back of my dad's car. And he was like, he was like, God, I was just so arrogant to leave the car unlocked when I ran into the house to get one last thing. And I was like, man, I wonder where I got this from. <laughs> Did you scream, God damn it, and a bunch of expletives and start stomping around? Because then I'd believe it. <laughs> Uh, we've got a letter here, Adam. Uh, by the way, we're uh, going to try a little thing of releasing just the video of us opening the presents on YouTube. So if you uh, don't already follow our YouTube channel and would like to see all this stuff, uh, you can go check it out there. It's a great new idea that Wendy had for this segment. Dear Adam and Ben, my wife and I got into TNG during COVID lockdowns, and since then we try to watch an episode a week. Right now we are on season six of Voyager. Around the time we started, my buddy introduced me to the podcast, and since then, I've binged from the first episode to now. I don't dread Mondays anymore, but now that I have you two making crass Star Trek jokes and breaking down my now favorite sci-fi series. In April, I was able to travel to Toronto to visit my friends, one being the same friend who introduced me to the show, and together we went to the Great Hall Show. It was a whale of a time, drinks, laughs, king slice pizza, passing out on the Geo train. What more can you ask for? Sometimes I find myself chuckling in the office thinking of the milk sequence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> milk was a bad choice. <laughs> Love the Great Hall. This October, our city held its yearly comic-style pop culture con after being on hiatus for a few years because of COVID. This year, a local antique shop had a booth that was primarily Star Trek collectibles. I was originally there searching for a next-gen replica communicator badge, but spotted binders of Trek CCGs, and lo and behold, 
There was a Natty Jaeger for sale. I did not find the communicator badge that day, but instead walked away with a different treasure. I figured I'd send it your ways, and you two fight to the death over it using only two-fisted overhand punches at Vasquez Rocks. The winner shall earn the prize of a natural Jaeger, which will promptly be slotted into a three-ring binder and shoved into a closet to collect dust till the inevitable need space yard sale. Thanks again for the laughs, Brandon. And what Brandon has included in this very jazzy bag is indeed, Adam, a natural Jaeger. Wow, with the foil and everything. With the foil and everything. Was there a, a price on that? Because that can go for hundreds of dollars on eBay. I'm very curious to know if there's a convention loophole for... <laughs> <laughs> Much like the uh, like the gun show loophole here in the U.S., if there's a the Jaeger bubble uh, loophole. Jaeger show loophole in Canada where you can buy a Jaeger at a price lower than one hundred dollars, that's really got me thinking. I I never thought I would see one at a convention, so I've never really looked. But now I will. Yeah, now we got to. Got to keep the bubble going. This is great. Uh, I don't think I have my own Jaeger, so since Adam owns the lion's share of all Jaegers everywhere. Uh, I think I'm going to hang on to this one, and uh, he can try and wrench it out of my cold, dead fingers if he wants. Well, contractually, we've always said that ownership and voting rights to Uxbridge Shimoda LLC had to do with how many natural Jaegers <laughs> each of us possessed. <laughs> so That's I true. believe we're at like 38 to 1. <laughs> this next one is from Chicago, Illinois. Another verified package, Adam. Oh, good. We have Compromat in the slack. Oh, good. To Ben and Adam, or Adam and Ben. There's an interior letter here. It's pages and pages of material here. Oh, boy. Ben and Adam, I hope this package finds you both well. I wanted to send you a small token of gratitude from a friend of DeSoto at our very own Section 31, the CIA. I work on Russia issues, and as you can probably imagine, this year has been a long one. But through the late nights, early mornings, and red eyes in economy, you two have been stalwart companions, bringing some much-needed levity to a team a little bit embarrassed to listen to a Star Trek podcast. To thank you for your service, I have enclosed a few small items that I hope will solidify your status as the official Star Trek comedy podcast of the U.S. Intelligence Community. Wow! We do have people across the... Uh, U.S. intelligence community. I love that for us. I'd want them on on our side, not against us. Yeah, yeah. Don't uh, don't look at our texts, okay? <laughs> <laughs> First off is a letter opener, which I hope will offer you some protection from any errant glitter-lined envelopes. The seal is the envelope of the Office of Strategic Services, the CIA's World War II predecessor. As I'm sure you know, judging from the podcast that I sense is now podcasta non grata, but that I still very much enjoyed. The OSS was our first foray into intelligence with predictably mixed results. Much like these first episodes of TGG, there's much pride to be had in the achievements of the glorious amateurs. I do know about the OSS. I had an uncle that uh, worked in the OSS back in the day. And couldn't talk about it or talked about it a little bit with you. Uh, I, I found some things out about <laughs> <Yeah>. it. Yeah. <laughs> also, um, the logo of the United Nations. Here's a weird uh -huh. one. This researcher was working on a book and reached out to my father about getting permission to republish a map that my grandfather drew. because My grandfather was a cartographer, and he discovered that my grandfather drew the original map that they copied for the... UN logo, which is, you know, like mm -hmm. the earth with the, you know, all the continents kind of coming out yeah. and it's looking down from the top. That was a map that he drew that was adapted by somebody at the OSS, which is so weird, like that the UN used the graphic design services of the U.S. intelligence community. That's great. <laughs> to get their logo. Use what you got. Okay. So second, I have a few OSS branded wine stoppers. Next time Damar stops by and leaves half the canar in the bottle, I hope you'll find some utility in these to keep your beverages fresh. I love how this person is on the one hand complaining about flying economy, <laughs> listening to us to get him through that, and also sending us their branded wine stoppers. Yeah. 
I wonder if these, yeah, are they like still manufacturing OSS branded wine stoppers? <laughs> That's amazing. Lastly, a pair of challenge coins for the two of you, Ooh. which I hope will convey my gratitude for keeping the wheels turning through some very challenging times. It must feel strange to know there are so many out there who you don't even know exist for whom your podcast has become a little like an old trusted friend. Thanks for all you do and look forward to the next episode. Best, G. Well, like being employed at any intelligence agency, that you can't really be truthful about what you're doing yeah. or what you're listening to. You need a cover story. So there's a little PS at the end here with like a Proton Mail address because uh, the name and address that they put on the letter are not their real name and address. Wow. Hold it closer to the camera so uh, they can really be seen. They're really nice looking. Wow. I think they're kind of kind of the same on the front and the back, right? Or do they just look the same on the front and the back hmm. and they're hiding something? Hmm. Interesting. Really cool. Wow. Well, I'm going to see you tonight, so I'll uh, I'll bring your OSS wine stopper and challenge coin. And uh, if you want it, you can have the letter opener. I might actually use the letter opener for the rest of this segment. That's what it's there for. Do it. All right. We got another verified package here. This one came to us from Brick Rock Press in Moab, Utah. Let's see if there's a letter. Oh, there is. Oh. Oh, awesome. Okay. Happy holidays, Greatest Trek crew. Thanks a bunch for the great P1 for my Brick Rock Press stuff. I wanted to include a joke about saying Legos instead of Lego, but ran out of space, so Ben's comment was perfect and gave me a big laugh. Anyway, there's some swag from my shops that I thought you might like. I have included some 2023 calendars and FOD badges for you guys, plus Bill and Wendy. So be sure to share. The rest is some of the odds and ends that I thought you might like, including some isolinear chips that have an FOD Easter egg on them, and some of my classic space monitors that are totally Elcars inspired. There's also some poker tips for Adam, my fellow gambling degenerate. Oh, good. Thanks for years. Great pod. I'm on my second run through and it still makes me laugh. Thanks, Andrew. Wow. Show me those chips. So we got calendars here. There's the chips. Uh -huh. They're littles. Uh, I think they're, you know, one pip chips. Those are great. Yeah. These are like uh, very cool Lego minifigs in uh, various outdoorsy situations. Neat. Got the friend of DeSoto. Ooh. Bricks, which uh, we saw on the Brick Rock Press website. Yeah. Uh, we will be sending a cease and desist uh -huh. about that. Uh, you know, those can only be sold through podshop.biz. This is um, a bunch of computer screens and Elcars things. Oh, cool. Little mini isolinear chips on Lego pieces. Those look really like you'd find them in a kit. Yeah, and there, there's like USPS priority mail. There's that special metal that the Mandalorian makes all his uh, helmets and shit oh, out of. Cool. Yeah. You can do a mini fig mail call. Yeah. Man, Andrew, this rules. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we will definitely forward the calendars on to Bill and Wendy. For sure. I have all these gray walls that I need to put something on. <laughs> do we get one of those calendars or are they just for Bill and Wendy? No, there's four. There's oh, great. There's one for everyone in the gang. All right. All right. This one is from Hoover in Pleasanton, California. It's just a, it's a card. It's, it seems to be a Commander Data-like person, perhaps with their dick in a box. Looks that way. It says, uh, hope your holidays are fully functional in every way. LLAP. And this is from uh, CT Grey Tunes, at CT Grey Tunes. Oh, yeah. Longtime friend. Who uh, famously animated a bunch of our early bits. Yeah. That's great. Those still get a lot of play. Those are really funny. I love those. That was like one of the great thrills of my life. Yeah. When, when I realized that my Star Trek podcast had inspired an animation. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is a, a slightly bigger one. This is from Misty in Las Vegas. All right, there's a big, there's something that says, do not cut this side. Okay, that's like a Claymore mine. Aim the thing <laughs> the other way. <laughs> yeah. 
Dear Ben and Adam, thank you so much for your wonderful pod. I started watching DS9 over the summer, and I was desperate for someone to share my enthusiasm with. I found TGG on a list of best Star Trek pods, and that's in scare quotes. So, Where the hell was that? We aren't usually on lists. Yeah, uh, and I've been binging you guys ever since. Once I caught up with TGG, I started on TGT, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do when I get caught up over there. I have hearing aids that are basically hidden Bluetooth speakers, so I've been sneaking pod in while it's slow at work. Wow. Or when I want to ignore my family when I'm at the grocery store. Or, okay, maybe I have a problem. <laughs> Anyways, I was listening to the TGG episode about Voyager Season 4, Episode 1, when Adam said something that not only made me laugh, it inspired me mm. to design a cross-stitch pattern. And then, of course, I had to make the actual cross-stitch. Ben, you have also inspired me to design cross-stitch, but these take a while. So maybe you'll get one in another six months or so. <laughs> hey, thanks for picking me first. <laughs> yeah. Upon seeing the design, he who is a, my husband said, it's great, but also now I'm kind of worried about you. I took that to me and I shouldn't keep it in the house. So now I've sent it to you, the men who inspired it. Hang it on a wall, maybe in a closet, maybe let it fall behind a desk or a couch so that you find it when you next move and are briefly traumatized to realize it was there all along. Or wrap it up and give it as a gag gift. I'm sure your wives would find that hilarious. Thanks for being great podsman, Misty. P.S. Quick shout out to the DrunkShimoto.com Discord. You are all the best. Special thanks to Random Trek live streams with Vita Z. They always show up right when I need them the most. P.P.S. There is no glass in the frame because cross stitch behind glass looks dumb in my opinion so probably don't hang this anywhere that it could get damp like a kitchen or bathroom <laughs> or ben's house or my house you can vacuum it if it collects hairs or put glass in the frame if you really really want to p p p s hope to catch you guys at and the fod's next time you're in vegas i can't take anyone who is interested in the best sushi restaurant that is not on the strip oh very wow. interested in that yeah Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It does look better without the glass. <laughs> this says, assimilate me daddy. And uh, it is a beautiful cross stitch. Yeah. And uh, wow. <laughs> That's going to look great in your studio, Adam. Really will. Yeah. It's going to be... So nice for guests of the show to come in and, and see that. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, bringing this over so that you could hang it on your wall. Me too. Hey, thanks very much for that thoughtfulness. I can't wait to see what Ben's getting for his. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Adam. That just about does it for uh, uh, opening up presents on this Code 47. What a fun session it was this time. It really was. We have some more packages in hand, but we just uh, don't have pictures of them yet. We don't have the, the copper mat yet for those. And once we get it, we'll open those on a future episode. Sure will. Right here, live on videotape. Yeah, but uh, I'm going to start pouring myself some champagne, and I think we should probably get into today's episode of Star Trek colon Voyager, Adam. You want to tell people what we're in for on the main pod? Sure will, Ben. Star Trek Voyager Season 5, Episode 14. Bliss. Reverse course. Unless you've got something a little bigger in your torpedo tubes, I'm not turning around. <laughs> Cheers to you, my friend. Oh, you're not open yet. Uh, I got to open up this bottle. <laughs> ben, what are you drinking for the special Talaxian champagne episode we have? I'm drinking some actual champagne here. It's Champagne Grémier. Uh, I don't know much about it. I, it sounded really fresh and clean. Uh, I bought it from a local wine store here in LA called Vinovore, where they only stock wines made by women winemakers. Hey, that's nice. French women specifically. Yeah, the best. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever bought a bottle of wine there that I didn't think was really great. So Ooh, I got a tight cork. Ben, I stole a bottle of sparkling wine for my wife she belongs to a wine club that has delivered this yeah you, your wife has a real like love-hate relationship with wine clubs because it seems like you guys enjoy what you get but you get a lot god i can't open this oh do you want to go see if your wife can loosen it up for you 
<laughs> uh, damn. I usually do not have a hard time with this. I'm going to have to get some pliers or something. <laughs> I'm going to go get some pliers. Hold on. While Adam is uh, obtaining pliers, I can let you in on a little secret. I snuck over to his house and epoxied the cork shut on his wine. <laughs> <laughs> One hour later. All right, I've gone out to the tool shed. I've got some channel lock pliers here. Oh, great. What you're going to want to do is get some channel locks <laughs> and grab the quack and then turn the bottle, which is what I'm doing. Okay, we got it. We've got some purchase on this quark. Now. And now I have opened the... Uh, 2019 Sparkling Pinot Manure. Mmm. Manure is a, not a word I would put on a food product that I was trying to sell. Manure! I hate manure! It says manure. Do you see? Sparkling Pinot Manure. Mmm. I guess it does. See? I got an ice bucket here, but I won't need it for long. I think this is going to go down fast. Ben, our cold open... Follows a uh, a loafy space guy. Very familiar loafy face space guy. Yeah, uh, he goes all the way back into uh, early TNG for us, and maybe Bill Tilly's first card he ever made. He's uh, <laughs> he's yelling the balls as he goes into this nebula. It looks like he's driving the space RV f- from Spaceballs into this thing. <laughs> the Spaceballs. <laughs> <laughs> He's heading toward a big brown space butthole that looks very irritated. Yeah, does look like it may need a little dab of some kind of analgesic or calming cream. Sure. Maybe a wipe would be nice. Mm, Yeah. Or or maybe just a crossfade. (laughs) Because this this cold open is basically over before it starts. Yeah. Yeah, and we don't hear from this guy for a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. When we come back from theme, we are on the bridge. They're talking about a wormhole. And Janeway is, you know, found out about one wormhole too many. She is suspicious from jump. A direct route to Earth's doorstep. Out of the blue. What's wrong with this picture? She's over it. W slash R slash T. Who's? Yeah, this space butthole is a good surprise on just about every measure. Normally, butthole stuff... If it's a surprise, bad. Real bad. <laughs> but this one's good. Yeah. This one is good, but like they don't believe it at first. It's yeah. a it's like a this is there's something up here. And then I don't know. I just I liked the uh like give me a fucking break with a magic wormhole to earth. You know? Yeah, Janeway is immediately suspicious. And I was like, Well, you got a probe. Why don't you do something with that? Why don't we burn a probe on this? We'll fire that probe. There's coffee and it's really out there. We don't find out about any of that until later because we cut over to the Delta Flyer and that's where Seven, Naomi Wildman, and Tom Paris are heading back from a deuterium hunt. Paris is that cool airline pilot who lets the kid up front in the cockpit. Yeah. But unlike most airline pilots, he lets Naomi Wildman fly the plane. <laughs> yeah, you want to you hit some buttons? Yes, sir. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> we recently took a flight with Darone, and he got little airline wings. I didn't know they still did that. That's sweet. Yeah. That's really sweet. It was cool. Um, yeah, so Naomi Wildman gets to put the ship to impulse. She's feeling like this was kind of a shitty field trip overall because she didn't really get to do anything they didn't find deuterium and there's a lot of uh you know reassuring her that you know this was worthwhile because you learned a lot about how the ship works and uh you got to push a button or two and then there's a like a conked out kiddo in the hallway on voyager tom paris is carrying naomi wildman home and while he and seven are walking her back to her quarters there's some some crewmen running through the halls. Yeah. Yeah, and they kind of shrug it off as though, oh yeah, those crewmen? Well, they're always late to their shift. Yeah. Not a big deal. But in retrospect, it feels like they're running because they're happy, right? Yeah. They were running (laughs) because they were happy. Yeah. So they make a deal. Tom Paris is going to catch 
those hands from Ensign Wildman when he explains why her daughter is home late. Yeah. Seven is going to catch up on all the, uh, you know, paperwork for the, the mission. But when she arrives in the ass lab, she finds a beehive of senior officer activity. <laughs> I'm not even drunk yet, and I'm already slurring the word officer. Occasionally when I get drunk, I call them Hirschnerk. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, they're Hirschnerk. <laughs> my favorite officers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would hate this. If this were my cubicle, I mean, this happened to me before when I had a square job. I like roll around the corner, I'm back from lunch or something. There's a bunch of people in my cubicle. Yeah. Get the fuck out. What are you doing in here? Don't sit on my desk. That's a picture of my wife. Don't touch that. <laughs> That's a picture of Ben's wife. Don't touch that. <laughs> hey, why do you have that in here? <laughs> I mean, it's everyone, basically. It's Janeway, Tuvok, Kim, and Chakotay are in there, and they've got this butthole up on the screen. Yeah. They show the telemetry of the probe going right into yeah. it. And uh, they're like, the readings are good. Yeah. Like, everything we have done to try and disabuse ourselves of this butthole being too good to be true has failed. Seven is ordinarily a stoic. I, I don't think that's an unfair... Did I completely fuck that up? Did I, like, triple negative myself into saying the opposite of what I meant? No. What I mean to say is that this butthole seems too good to be true, but none of the readings that they have done could verify that, so they believe it is, in fact, true. Then, like every episode lately, we're being edited into coherence. <laughs> So uh, it's a lot of like back slapping and uh, this is great. We're going to head toward it, you know, reroute the ship or whatever. Seven can't get on their level of optimism though. And it's not just because she's like generally kind of a stoic person. It's that no one could be this optimistic. Right. It's like if you've ever been like not drinking and shown up to a party where everybody else is already really drunk, it's like, ah, like I, the vibe is not here for me, you know? It's kind of like the depiction of Mormons in the Book of Mormon. Like, it's just kind of an unbelievable Hello. amount of positivity here. <laughs> My name is Elder Price, and I would like to share with you the most amazing book. So, like, the next day or something, Seven is in Janeway's office, and she's like, yeah, I'm just kind of sketched out by the whole thing. There's, like, weird neutrino levels, and that seems super strange. And Janeway's got an answer for everything. Yeah. Turns out those faint signals we detected were communiques from Starfleet. Not just answers, like super positive answers. Yeah, and like they've checked all the math on all these things and they feel really, really good. It's like that meeting that Jack Ryan takes in Clear and Present Danger where or like, it's not just a neutrino situation, it's a good neutrino situation. <laughs> it's not just a space butthole, it's... My best space butthole. Lifelong space butthole. <laughs> Friends are what we are. Yeah. You just give them nowhere to go. Right. I said that. Our course is locked in. Do it. Listen to me very carefully because I'm only going to say this once. Do it. The captain and Chakotay have both received letters from home. The captain's received a number of them, <laughs> one of which included word that uh, Tom Mervins is no longer uh, engaged to be married. So, uh, the too good to be trueness at this point is a little overwhelming because like Chakotay is holding a pencil in this scene and it goes unsnapped. <laughs> the news is great. Tom has broken it off with that harlot he was engaged to <laughs> and the family dog he was going to euthanize before beginning that relationship. He's decided not to. <laughs> it's weird dog cancer is in remission. <laughs> he said he wanted a fresh start. <laughs> but how is that the dog's fault? Seven walks down to her room and f tries to fire up the captain's logs. And the, the ship is like, you can't, you can't read the captain's stuff. And she goes open and like takes a panel off of a wall, pushes one thing and <laughs> over. And is watching Captain Janeway go from like the most skeptical to the least skeptical over the course of three logs. We should be back in the Alpha Quadrant in a matter of days. I thought it was interesting what this moment suggested, right? Because Janeway starts so negative and pivots so quickly into the positive, you can't help but feel like something kind of supernatural has happened. Yeah, and it's frustrating because it's a log where you can't see the base of her neck at all. I know. 
So you don't know what's like influencing the way she thinks. Yeah. Hard to know. So Tevin is still super perturbed. And I feel like the next few scenes are sort of about her going around looking for allies in this situation. And her first stop is with Tom Paris after getting like bumped into by Neelix in the hallway. And he's got a letter for her from like a member of the of the Hanson clan. They're a very credible band that has done a lot more than that one thing that they're very famous for, Adam. All right. We have their Christmas album. Really? In our household. They did a uh, a really fun album of Christmas music that we play oh. during the holidays every year. That's delightful. Uh, yeah. I'll have to keep my eyes peeled for their Hanukkah album. Yeah. <laughs> oh, are you taking a broad right now? I'm having a broad right now. I want to remind you. I am really struggling with the bubbles of this sparkling wine. I'm trying to drink as fast as I Ooh. can, and the bubbles are just going all up my nose. Maybe trying to drink as fast as you can is a bad idea. <laughs> are you saying, hold on, Doc. <laughs> are you saying I should try to enjoy the things that are good? <laughs> Uh, Tom Paris, not prepared to align himself with Seven over this. Now he's like, I got a letter from, from my Admiral Daddy, and he thinks I'm great. He said, if I want to play with toy boats when I come home, he'll let me. Yeah. And also, he loves me now. He approves of my lifestyle. <sighs> this is the tip over point, right? Like, everyone in the mess hall is as bubbly as the champagne we're drinking. Mm. Like you see the wide shot of the mess hall and people are like fist pumping all over the place. Yeah, yeah. They're just, they're, it's like double fist pumping the whole time. Paris is get your own sandwich happy. He's like in the back with the cold cuts and stuff. Like, See, that read to me like a cry for help. <laughs> I was like, don't do it, Paris. Don't eat a sandwich. There's so many better foods in the world. I wish one of the consequences of this episode was that when it was over, they are like, Yikes, we really ate all of the food and uh, <laughs> consumed a lot of resources thinking that we wouldn't have to worry about it in a day. And now we're really struggling. <laughs> we were already pretty low on deuterium at the beginning of the this situation. <laughs> in both the deuterium and the cold cuts department. <laughs> really low. <laughs> so, uh... Up on the bridge, they get an image of Earth up on the screen, and it's a little like staticky, you know. They're getting it through the the view screen. Yeah, it's a it's the blurry porn channel of Earth, is what it is. Mm -hmm. You can yeah. just barely make it out, but it's enough. Paris does that thing where he like jumps over the console like both feet at the same time, and he's like, "I know how to fix this," and he, he goes and like messes with some some of those cables behind the screen. Yeah. And it clears up a lot better. If you blink really fast, you can kind of make it out. <laughs> Seven is watching this, and she is still, like, the person at the party who is not prepared to rage. Yeah. Well, she's also checked in with, like, the EMH who was like, mm, yeah, I haven't heard anything about this wormhole situation, but I guess I'll, like, yeah. surreptitiously look for anything weird in, like, my you know, checkups of people over the next couple of days. Right. Even though everyone has had that weird photograph taken of them. Yeah. Not too long ago, he did all those. Well, he has that as a baseline to compare this to. It had to be scary to get this recheck message from the doc, right? Yeah. I thought everything was fine. <laughs> you want to see me again? Yeah. What's the bad news, doc? And we're about to go home? Like, can't we just wait yeah. till we go home? It's right there. Everyone around me has this great news. You're going to give me an awful diagnosis? God damn it! Am I too bad for my home? <laughs> <laughs> Seven remains extremely sus. Yeah. She walks off the bridge. She's like scanning the wormhole. She's super sus about how mid she finds the uh, the news about, <laughs> about this wormhole. <laughs> this is turning into a Gen Z podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Only in how interested they are in this space butthole. Yeah. Well, she finds uh, maybe a polyp or, a, you know, a lesion, mm -hmm. something in the space butthole that might be yeah. cause for concern. Yeah, you got to hail that thing, right? Seems like a ship, maybe, but the 
computer won't cop to that. But she blows in a call to this thing, and lo and behold, this guy answers, and he says, there is no electronic frontier <laughs> in this space butthole. There is no stockade. The only escape is on the surface. And she's like, oh, what do you mean? And he's like, anyways, it's tricking you. It's tri he knows exactly what you want. Tuvok walks in right after this, and he is not trying to hear about this whatever that Seven might have seen. Yeah. This is like, you know, in middle school, you, you know, go over to some kid's house and he's like, I found porn on like over the air television. We don't even have cable. And I found a dirty channel. And you're like, prove right. it. And he's like, no. And he's like working the working the rabbit ears. Everyone has letters from like a partner back home except for seven. And this is her opportunity to be like, yeah, uh, my Canadian boyfriend is out in, in that space butthole. I just talked to him. <laughs> He's happy to see me. Yeah. He has some warnings about what's going on here. I met him because he went to a different school for a semester. Yeah. You don't know him. Tuvok. But like the one person you'd think would be able to fight off whatever this is. Uh, whatever this is that we don't know about yet. Seven's like, look, man, like you're a logic person. You got to be on the side of being a little bit suspicious about this whole thing, right? Yeah. And not only is Tuvok not into pursuing a logical angle, he shuts down the ass lab and tells her to get the fuck out. Access to the ass lab is restricted until further notice. I loved this scene because no mention is made of that, no appeal to his logic. Yeah. It's all subtext and it's like it's a scene that kind of relies on you to know these characters and what they're about and yeah. like what their natural alignments are and what their natural conflicts are. Yeah. It just lets that play out naturally. And I thought it was so strong. How terrifying is Tim Russ in this moment, though? Like, he's the scariest person on the ship to me in this moment. Yeah, he really freaks me out. <laughs> Back in the alcove, like, that's basically where Seven's been banished to. She hears a clunking across the room and the clunking is Naomi Wildman as she's hiding behind a crate and she does not like how happy everyone is. They're all acting strange, even mom. Not into it. Naomi Wildman seems immune to whatever is going on or at least super desperate and you can tell because she's carrying that flutter doll with yeah. her. Yep. Terrifying. I think that the thing that's scariest about it is that its head is the same size as her head, but its body is like, you know, an eighth the size of her body. <laughs> is the Flutter doll like those dolls that are made to wet themselves realistically? <laughs> <laughs> and liquid just drains out of the Flutter's fingers? Mm, yeah. Parents hate this toy. So we're going to make one that shits itself as well. Objection noted. We'll do this without you. Do it. Get do it. Do it. Do it. Objection noted. We'll do this without you. Do it. Get do it. Do it. Do it. Seven is like, ah, oh, fuck. Like, just hide here. It's obviously super creepy. Whatever's going on, I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. You don't need to worry about it. You're a little kid. So she goes back to six bay to try and talk to the doctor to see what he's found out. But damn it, the doctor's been deactivated. And it's Paris who's there. And this is such an interesting choice by the show, right? Because the question hanging in the air in that scene between Seven and Naomi Wildman is like, well, if they're not affected by whatever this is, then they were just together with Paris. I would have also assumed that Paris would be unaffected too. Right. But when Seven goes to Six Bay and Paris is clearly afflicted with whatever this is. He's full pod person at this point. I'm at a total loss yeah. for what's going on here. The energy is so creepy. Like they don't do much with like the music or the like it's just a bunch of like smiles and pats on the back and like This is what it feels like to be me, like freshly moved to LA from Seattle. Like <laughs> this is how paranoid I was during every interaction. I couldn't understand it. <laughs> Why are people being nice and friendly? What's it about? Yeah, why are people excited about their future prospects? <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. The next scene like doubles down on this because Chakotay is like grinning and, and being like super friendly as he like marches Seven off to be put into like suspended animation because they're like some story about 
oh, your implants will react badly. Oh, it's like it's like there's like a Borg. Yeah. The Borg will be able to pick us up in the wormhole as we go through because of your implants or something. How conspicuous were those dustbusters, though? Like, it does not seem like a request when you're wearing a dustbuster. Yeah. Just, uh, hey, like, we all got armed and came down to see you. No particular reason. I think visually they have to be there to double down on how mm-hmm. threatening it's got to feel to be seven. Well, also, like, deck five is an open carry deck. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> but also there's, like, that that power of, like, three dudes telling a woman to do something, and they've got weapons that is, like, especially creepy. Yeah. You don't like it. It's not good. Uh, he, like, he makes resistance as futile jokes as they walk around with her. Hey, that's not your word, Chicote. Yeah. My culture is not your costume, Chicote. <laughs> My culture is not your quip. My dolphin is not your jewelry. This was peak terror for me because if they managed to shut her off, what chance does she have? It's all over. Yeah. And we cut away from this. Like we go we go seven eyes to commercial and then we're back on the bridge and it's a bunch of like happy creepos looking at the wormhole out the view screen talking about how great this is about to be like like harry kim is listing off all the bad aliens they've run into and isn't that totally effective at making you feel upset and out of balance like scene to scene we're going from really happy crew people that we know like and care about and one that is terrified yeah and uh they get her down to her regeneration station and uh, she pulls a fast one on them. She erects a Borg force field, a Borg field, if you will. I thought for a second you'd make me spit take, but uh, no, not even close. Not even close. Wow. <laughs> Fuck. Absolutely savage. <laughs> we were out the other night <laughs> with our friend and agent and his wife, and I made a, a strained pun, if you will. Uh-huh. I think it was they they had gone to an Izakaya restaurant in Ojai. Mm-hmm. And I asked if it was called Is Ohia mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. And uh, our friend and agent's wife turned to me and said, That's not funny. Oof. After he had said it was funny. Yeah. Split household there. And the group fell along gender lines. The wives were all furious at me for even trying. I know exactly what that pain is like. Just, man. I, just want, I just want the interaction to be fun. You know, I'm you like, had my axe in that moment. I defended your comedy honor. Yeah, you did. But but it's like, what's wrong with making a joke? What is wrong with adding a little levity, a little wordplay to the banter? Hey, how tough do you think uh, our friend and agent's night was after that, after they went home? <laughs> I can't believe you thought that was funny. <laughs> then why are you still laughing, Todd? I don't know, Marco. <laughs> Our friend and agent's wife is like one of the sweetest, kindest people I know. And I think that that made it hurt all the harder. You know what's funny is how much she resents that description. She's like, I am a normal person with moods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The great news for us is that uh, our wives are becoming great friends with her, so we're never going to get dropped by the Creative Artists Agency. Yeah. We're (laughs) becoming deeply entangled in both uh, personal and professional relationships. Yeah. It's big fun. Which means this scandal is going to be uh, especially painful when it comes. This has never gone badly before, (laughs) this kind of thing. (laughs) So Seven has to take over the ship now. She gets Naomi Wildman to like, Naomi Wildman is out hacking Harry Kim in this scene. Yeah. I mean, that's the promise of a Seven of Nine is that she's eventually going to date you. Right. And that's what happens here. Yeah. Seven of Nine, site to site transports to engineering and she KOs everybody that's on engineering shift with her giant phaser rifle and puts up a force field before Tuvok can stop her. But... Janeway is like, let's give her a little of her own medicine and sends a Herogen electrical blast through the computer system to knock Seven out. I love this. Seven's going into stasis whether she likes it or not. Let me know if our friend gives us any more trouble. There's so much fun happening in such a short amount of time here. 
It's great. Very soft landing for Seven of Nine, though, for being shocked with the Wharf Lightning. Yeah. She doesn't do that thing where she bounces off a couple of walls. She very, very slowly goes to the floor. Let the body slowly go to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so with Seven of Nine taken out and no further questions from the bridge about like, hey, should we like maybe try and drop the force field and attend to the injured down there or anything? No way. They head into the wormhole. And when we see the ship from the exterior, it looks like a mouth closing around the ship. It, it's very fleshy and gross. Yeah, in, in great contrast to what we saw earlier, which was like a bright, whitish, bluish, bleached almost kind of space butthole. Mm, this is not that. Once we get inside, we realize uh, just how thorough the pre-shower was. This is uh, hairy, yeah. nicotine-stained, <laughs> truck stop ass butthole. <laughs> Yeah. It is a rocky ass ride too. And you can tell because the Janeway hair has gone full volume. <laughs> Did you notice this? Yeah. It's maybe as big as I've ever seen it. She's got the biggest hair. Yeah. And uh, when we come back from commercial, we're getting like dream sequence slow mo of yeah. like Neelix glad handing with admirals. And how sad is it that that's his dream? Like all of these dream sequences, <laughs> and that's his. Uh, yeah. And they all love Leola Roots too. Oh, Neelix, give me a second helping. My bowl is almost empty. I hope you brought seeds because this doesn't grow in the Alpha Quadrant and we all think it's delicious. Oh, the best part is that I rarely have to shit afterwards. I can eat bowl after bowl. Very solid poops. <laughs> Tuvok runs into his wife in the hallway and like a really heavy bass lick starts playing. Yeah, I mean, they finger bang right there in the hallway. That's, that's, that's shit nasty. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean. That got Savick pregnant in the movies. It's true. The bodies are all strewn around the ship, though. These are dream sequences. They're all passed out, and Naomi Wildman is the only one that isn't. You know what that means, Ben? Ice cream party! <laughs> she goes down to the mess hall and she walks up to the soft serve machine and holy shit. Yeah. It is like she makes a bucket of soft serve. It's like one of those scenes from like an 80s film where a kid just does exactly what a kid wants to do. Yeah. But there's a grisly element to it because she keeps dragging new crew people over to scan their fingerprint yep. to use their replicator rations. So it's got this kind of like jubilant kids letting loose energy, but all this kind of like horror movie dragging bodies around energy at the same time. Very true. Yeah. It's big fun. And finally, like she just eats herself sick yeah. off of the soft serve. Yeah. Well, she, she got a Ziggy Piggy. <laughs> The single greatest ice cream yeah. spectacle known to man. It usually takes three or four people to defeat the Ziggy Piggy, but Naomi Wildman did it by herself. Yeah. Well, everybody else was unconscious. I've got to get that platinum. Get that roll by enlargement. Yeah, yeah. I've got to get that platinum. Would not. Are you planning a heist? Gold. Yes, it's the After the ice cream party, she uh, waddles over to engineering, just sick, <laughs> just sick to her stomach, where she finds Seven on the ground, and she she wakes her up by kind of making a racket at the little barrier. Yeah, she's banging her little fists against the, the <laughs> force field. The sound design's really cool here because the bangers that they hear after going in the space butthole, they really sound like indigestion, like big indigestion. Yeah, like super bassy yeah. tummy gurgles yeah, mixed with lightning. And Seven tries to send Naomi away, but uh, like the viewer is, we're kind of stuck with her. Yeah, Naomi makes the two heads are better than one Borg philosophy pitch, which is sort of like, <laughs> like if, if you compare needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few to two heads are better than one. You see why the Federation bests the boards yeah. at every encounter, yeah. pretty much. Together they find Neelix out in a corridor and 
Naomi really wants to stay and like care for him. And Seven's like, leave him. He's done for. Yeah. Leaving Neelix behind is another core tenet of Borg philosophy. Yeah. We might have to eat him later. <laughs> so Seven promises that they're going to come back for him. And on their walk to the ass lab, they see out the window that it is just like the awful brown of the space boat hole that they're in. It is a total creep show outside. Yeah. We don't often see a corridor with windows. I feel like this is one of the first times we've seen that. Yeah, yeah. And and they had to do it on the Katie Couric episode. I have a pretty little colon. <laughs> it's so inspiring though, right? <laughs> Especially at the very end of the episode where, where the instead of credits, it's like where you can get uh, colonoscopy. Yeah. I was a busboy at a restaurant that Katie Couric ate in. The night before? No, uh, this was probably after all that. Yeah? She seemed just so nice. She seemed really pleasant. The rep is that she's the greatest. I'll stay up here a little longer. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. So they go down to the ass lab. They are going to look for the vessel. Hey, how are you doing on champagne, by the way? Oof. I am down to the label. Yeah, I'm a little past the label. Which I think is good. But these bubs are such an impediment. Yeah. I feel like this wine would be done if it were still. And I keep pouring more out so the bubs kind of dissipate. Yeah. Like I'm not finishing a glass. I'm trying to get these bubbles out of the way. Yeah. What is it? A? It, it's not a true champagne. It's a Napa. It is a Napa sparkling wine. But Ben, it's Methode Traditionnel. It's Methode Traditionnel. It is not a war crime. Methode Traditionnel. Yeah. It would be a war crime if they called it champagne. Right. Yeah, I mean, the war crime was taking the cork out with pliers. <laughs> you don't have a saber lying around your office? I don't. I don't have a saber and I don't have a letter opener. I I'm scared of that. Do you want the letter opener? No. You can, you can have the letter you opener. Need it. You need it. That's a home defense letter opener. It says Glorious Amateurs, 1942 to 1945. Oh, boy. Glorious Amateurs is one of them. Uh, Big Naturals is the other one that got sent, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then in really small lettering, it says, these teens are getting what they deserve. <laughs> that's kind of troubling. Is Big Naturals even a real magazine? For some reason, that's so lodged in my mind as a name of like a very unpopular, especially skeevy porno magazine that you could get like in the airport back when you could get porn in the airport which i feel like was a thing that people used to do for some reason i don't know if this is weird but i primarily associate the phrase big naturals with a sarah silverman joke about big naturals oh what's the joke i don't i don't even remember the joke i just remember that phrase being like really tremendous you know i mean look i i know my assets i've got i've got some you're lovely. I've got some big naturals. So back in the ass lab, Seven uh, scans where they are, where the ship is. And it becomes clear that they're inside a space whale butthole. Yeah. And Seven tries to find the ship from before. That, that one dude, the Canadian boyfriend she was talking to before. And that guy's ship is in really bad shape. Yeah. She wants to help. But this guy cannot believe her because help constitutes a sort of uh, thing he doesn't want to fall for. Yeah. He's, he's super paranoid. He's super paranoid about ever getting the thing he wants. And right. this will... Like us. This we will come to understand more, but he is finally persuaded to be beamed over by Seven of Nine. And when he sees that a uh, Borg and a child have... <laughs> come to his rescue he's like okay this is not like that's no one's fantasy yeah <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be a real sick fuck to have that be your your fantasy in your time of need <laughs> this is annika hansen adam not chris hansen <laughs> <laughs> oh shit wouldn't that be crazy if they were related <laughs> hey it's my long lost niece why don't you take a seat over there yeah <laughs> Thank you for rescuing me from my ship. I brought a couple of Mike's Hard Lemonades and a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing about that that's so weird. Like, why would pizza be a viable fooling around food? No matter what the age. Ugh. 
every single person on that. Like, just arrest him for that. Yeah. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if any of this sounds familiar while you enjoy your pizza. So this guy finally realizes that, yeah, no one's fantasy is this. No. And he chooses to live. So he gets beamed over to the Voyager directly to the ass lab where he kind of wistfully describes all the good things that he's been teased about since being in the space butthole. And he has been hunting this thing yeah. for years and years. And his latest idea was to be a thing that, that the space butthole absorbed that would allow him to destroy it from the inside. Like maybe he was, his ship was going to be full of weapons that could blow this thing up from inside it. But it was a trick too. Like this thing, this thing tricks him at every turn. Yeah. I was flying directly into his digestion chamber. You know, he thought he was getting a BJ and he was fucking it in the ass. <laughs> I mean, how confused do you have to be? Yeah. That's how powerful the psionic abilities of this creature are. Yeah. He is a real Ahab type. He rises! And he has made it his life's goal to destroy this thing. You know what his life's goal should be is to finish the eye makeup around the loaf mask that he's wearing. <laughs> yeah, he's got some. He's uh, got kind of an unfinished quality to him, doesn't he? Is that your loaf or is that scars? I've never met a, a species of your kind. <laughs> yeah. What does he call it? A like a cup teacup plant? Who? Naomi Wildman compares it to a plant that like eats insects. Oh yeah, that that releases pheromones to yeah. capture the insects. Yeah. Yeah, what's the kind of plant? Pitcher plant? This guy is so patient with the idea of a Naomi Wildman in, in, in his scenes. He's like, oh yes, great comparison, metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would have he gotten along with the Temerians from Jump. Yeah. One of the experiments they run right away is like, look, we have a whole crew here and they're just asleep. If we could wake them up, we could marshal their effort in an attempt to get out of this thing. And they and they start with BLT. She's up on the bio bed. They stick some uh, clip show devices on her face and they wake her up. And when BLT comes to, she is tripping balls. Yeah. She's tripping the balls, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Katai has been like, I've tried this on several occasions and it doesn't work. And the EMH is like, shut up. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And then she comes to and she's like, oh my God, it's all of the Maquis. Maquis? Tom Riker. And Tom Riker again. <laughs> and he wants to make out with me. Oh yeah. And Calvin Hudson. <laughs> And Eddington, they're all, they want to do like a scene, like a group sex thing. Oh, and I'm so into it too. Bellano, you're still on Voyager. You're hallucinating. And there's Seska, and she wants to do it too. And she's like six months pregnant. Oh, and that's fine. Everyone has their own kinks. And that's mine. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Four dudes, two of whom are the same dude, and one six month pregnant Cardassian dressed as a Bajoran. <laughs> That's my thing. That's why I seem sort of indifferent to Tom Paris most of the time. Because <laughs> Tom Paris is one man and he's not extreme enough for me. And Katai and the doctor are like, we need to put her back out. <laughs> yeah, get the thing off her. Get the thing off her. <laughs> so they put her back asleep as soon as possible. And it becomes very clear that they are not going to get any help from anyone else. So the team now is Seven, Katai, the Doctor, and Naomi. Yeah. And they are mostly working from the med bay right now. And there's like, you know, a kind of dark night of the soul with yeah. Katai and the Doctor while Naomi sleeps. And, you know, another banger wakes up Naomi. She's like, hey, how's it going? Are we there yet? And... Oh, oh, you look bad, man. What happened? I just... Uh, the bubs get you? No, I'm just trying... I'm trying to burp quietly. Oh, okay. I'm full of the gases. Yeah. Yeah, that's unfair to our editor. Yeah. To, to let that fly on, Mike. We should get those. Well, how do you get a, a button? Like, you hear about people talking about their cough button on podcasts. I've got a stream deck here with a bunch of buttons. There should be a mute button on here that's possible. What's a stream deck? It's Well, back when we were streaming, it's a useful tool for uh, doing transitions and stuff. 
Oh. Didn't catch that one. Why do you have that? I was the one working all the streams. I know. I had some optimism about that continuing, but it was unfounded. I wasn't the one that stopped it. I know. It was me. I thought it was bad. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways. I get a letter from the Alpha Quadrant, and it says, you never have to stream anymore. Welcome (laughs) home. It was just what you wanted. (laughs) Katai is looking at the computer and he's like, I found something really tremendous. It's uh, this torpedo. And they're like, yeah, we don't have any more of those. Uh, that's not going to be an option. And we shot them all. The doctor's like, yeah, and we aren't really in the business of killing things, even things that try to eat us. So they come up with a very TNG galaxy's child plan. Mm-hmm. Got to sour the milk. Got to. Why don't we think of this from a, a nursing whale's perspective? This is a space baby, right? I liked how Katai sort of reads like the Shaw character in Jaws, but the doctor is like not trying to Richard Dreyfus around with him at yeah. all. <laughs> He's like, shut up, man. Like, I don't want to show you my scars. Like, like you suck. I don't like you. Yeah. I'm trying to find a bigger boat. In the transporter room, they're ready to send this guy back. And I like the pass that he makes the duck. He's like, you know... I could use someone like you, impervious to the flirtation of this thing. You're all business, Doc. And the Doc's like, uh, I'm a one-ship doctor. Yeah. I'm Doc Menominus. He says, do not call me Ishmael. Yeah. And uh, he beams that guy right back over to his ship. And they do this thing where they like vent the plasma out of the nacelles and Katai shoots it. It's kind of a culvert starburst situation, isn't it? I guess it is, yeah. It's a great looking explosion. Yeah. Too bad Paris isn't awake to see it. Paris is having his face sat on by his admiral dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's his fantasy? <laughs> yeah. All the fantasies are horny. Jesus, that that goes beyond horny. <laughs> like deviant horny. Yeah, like a search term that like gets you like a warning on Pornhub. Yeah. Dirty. Yep. <laughs> so they do this explosion and Seven's like, great, we're out. We're done. And Katai is like, you're not done. It's tricking you. Mm-hmm. You got what you wanted and, and you should be extremely suspicious of that. Yeah. And it really takes Katai and the doctor both talking really directly to her about how deeply she has been deceived because she used to be impervious to the things that this entity does. She's pervious now. (laughs) She's suddenly pervious. And what's going on here is pretty pervious, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) It's true, Ben. I mean, it's consistent with the idea that Seven's biggest dream would just be to get out of this situation. It's not to go home. Right. It's not for an admiral to sit on her face. It's to leave this space butthole. And that she thinks she has is kind of a warning that maybe she hasn't. Yeah. So they try another antimatter burst. That one works. And they actually get out of there. Seven, you know, pilots them out of range. They've moved all the, like, controls down to engineering. So she's got everything she needs right there. Yeah. She offers to help Katai with his ship. Uh He doesn't want any help. He's a a very self-sufficient man. Yeah. He's a self-sufficient man. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I wonder if, like, aliens that live in space are few and far between. Yeah. Is this thing related to Tin Man? Oh, gotta be. Is Katai related to Tin Man? He's got the same texture. Yeah, he sure does. Everybody suddenly is like waking up on the bridge and everything. And Janeway is like, ah, my hair, it's so big. What the fuck? (laughs) What happened? Are we home? What's our location? And I love Seven's take here. She's like, ask the doc. I'm going to bed. (laughs) As if that's okay here. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you need answers immediately? I think you do. You would think that people that were this excited would need immediate answers but uh we kind of smash cut to a captain's log that's like yeah we um you know we left warning boise Mm -hmm. around the creature Mm -hmm. to let other ships know not to get sucked into it it occurred to me that like 
they didn't want to kill this thing, but if they left warning Boise to prevent it from capturing the thing it eats, yeah. that is sort of tantamount to killing it. Great call. I mean, you got to drop the warning Boise. You just have to. You do. But it does mean death. Yeah. For this space butthole. A slow, painful death, unlike the one they were going to do. So why didn't they just murder it while they were up inside it, is the question, right? That would have been a mercy killing. Yeah, just mercy kill the thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's trying to eat you. Yeah. This episode deprived us of Janeway threatening to blow up the ship while inside it. Yeah. That made me sad, right? She was asleep. Yeah. You know? Instead of whispering, she was just like mumbling in her sleep like, I'm going to take this gruel and drop it on the carpet. That's nice. My fantasy is a sturdy hug from Tom Mervins. (laughs) (laughs) That just really gets my gears going. Anyways. Yeah. Our uh, our little button is uh, Katai back at it again. Ahabbing. Ahabbing it. Getting ready for another run at killing the beast. Hey, Haben. All episodes about a giant creature eating a smaller thing are bastards. <laughs> That's what it stands for. Yeah. Did you like this episode, Adam? You know, I'm really easy to get along with most of the time. But I don't like bullets. I don't like friends. And I don't like you. I'm just I love that final scene of like, the hunt goes on. Yeah. Katai goes back in like, hell yeah, Katai. Get on in there. That was kind of my favorite part of the episode. Yeah. Is that he lives to fight another day and he's been fighting this thing for 40 years. What a great character. The episode itself, like I'm surprised it took so long to get to uh, Space Moby Dick, you know? Or or space job or whatever. Yeah, there there are Miriam texts about the big thing swallowing up the narrator of the story, right? You know. Do you mean Jonah? Yeah. What did I say, Job? Yeah. Yeah. Jonah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Space Lot's wife, you know. And I feel like, <laughs> and I, I think it was done well here. It was a it was a fun episode, especially one to. Uh, Drink a lot of the bubs for. Yeah. Cheers, buddy. I'm uh this is my my final glass of the bubs. Mine too. Mine is fairly full, but it is full of the last. The the glass that you have is if if you can picture a bottle of red wine with the like dimple in the bottom. Uh-huh. And then they've cut it off about a third of the way up the bottle and made a and made a drinking glass out of that. I believe they call it the punt. The punt? Mm-hmm. Is the thing in the bottom? Yeah. That thing? Uh-huh. Hmm. Why is it called the punt? Because it looks like you kicked the bottle? Maybe. Yeah. Wow. Maybe so. Did you like the episode? I really liked the episode. I thought that the acting in this episode was kind of superlative. Like, the dude that plays Katai is such a fun Star Trek that guy. But he's, like, doing something very different in this episode. Like, talking to the screen a bunch and, like, yeah. yelling and, like, just being, like, I don't know. He's he just fucking rules. He's such yeah. a fucking great like character actor. W. Morgan Shepard played one, two, three, four, five characters in Star Trek and just owns them. Yeah. Every time. He's so much fun. He absolutely rules. I thought this episode was great. You know, like it's it's a kind of plot device that I feel like they've used in Voyager even like the nebula wants to eat us or the yeah. nebula is an entity was like I feel like we were like getting sick of those in in season one of Voyager but I thought this was a really original and good take on that and it's been a long enough time since they've done one of those that and the reason why was like the 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 variable of the like all your dreams coming true part. Like, what a fun spin on it. What a fun spin when when everyone's rendered unconscious. Like, it's it's not just stuck in a, in a whale. It's the way you're stuck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The way I'm stuck is on the Friends of DeSoto who send us Priority One messages. Adam, do you want to check out the Priority One inbox? Oh, yeah. I've been pulled in to the mouth of the P1s, Ben. 
Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Need a supplemental income. Supplemental income? Supplemental. Supplemental. Yeah, it's extra. But the interest alone could be enough to buy this ship. Our first P1 is of a promotional nature. It goes like this. You're already a little bit embarrassed to be a Star Trek fan, but what my theory presupposes is you're also a bit embarrassed to be a tabletop RPG nerd. <laughs> That's why your Dustbuster Club needs Gabriel Pickard's Encounter Maps. Map of Anybody, Anybody can, can, can Affirmative. Star Trek caves to explore? Yup. A fight inside a tin man? Tin man. I'll make it so. Just search the Roll20.com marketplace or DriveThroughRPG.com for Gabriel Pickard. That's P-I-C-K-A-R-D of the entrepreneur. Entreprickner. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I'm going to assume that's a typo. P-I-C-K-A-R-D <laughs> of the entrepreneur. Maker of all RPG maps everywhere. Gabriel Pickard, uh, boy, probably thought they were getting a sober read of their promotional message. I'm sorry, Gabriel Pickard. <laughs> the problem is that you share a last name with one John Luck Pickard. Right. And Gabriel Pickard on Roll20.com or drive through, drive through RPG.com. Yeah. Needs to make some sales this month, people. Like, go get over go there. Get some cool maps. Yeah. You know, my dungeon master making his own maps, doing a bad job. Oh. Oh, boy. These maps suck. I mean, and, and Gabriel Pickard's going to get the greatest gen bump here. So. Because it's just like, oh, yeah, we went down a hallway and then there's like one way we could go or a different way we could go. Great. Oh. Cool. It sounds like you're playing a real piece of shit Dungeons and Dragons game, man. One yeah. yeah. Doesn't sound fun. Doesn't sound like what Gabriel Pickard would do. He'd give you yeah. three options. He'd make you fight inside a tin man, which is basically like an empty, fleshy hallway. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that there's a uh, there's like a, a manhole cover that you can lift up somewhere in water deep. Yeah. And get inside a tin man. Oh yeah. You know. Yep. Yeah. Ben, our next priority one message. It's from Tior. It is to Temu, Kalyan, Zala, Latha, and Kyle. Message goes like this. Happy New Year to the best crew a cat could ask for. <laughs> you made 2022 brighter, and I can already tell 2023 will be the same. And then in parentheses, home improvement bit. What? We don't... Okay, yeah, let's do a home improvement bit. <laughs> Oh, uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we got a Binford doc <laughs> spreadsheet document here. You know what that means? More columns. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we got our neighbor. Like that, you know, you can only see half his face. Uh, Darone just went goth for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait for Tyrone's goth face. Yeah. But he's going to scare you, I bet. Mm, mm. All right. When you're going to run a ST Adventures game, be sure you have a professional like Kyle on board. I think they want you to do the, the, the Boston accent, Adam, and these people pay okay. good money for it. When you're going to run an ST Adventures game, be sure to have a professional like Kyle on board. He's a measure twice, cut once sort of fella. So you know his dauntless won't ever fail inspection. Wow. For as drunk as I was, that did not seem like a bad this old house. I thought you stuck the landing on that. That was good. Ooh, feels good. Dude, I wonder if Gabriel Pickard could sell a map to yeah. Tior or Kyle or somebody in that. This is an incestuous priority one message is, is what it Who, could be. Who's the DM in this group? Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. But like if their party wants to do a raid on a tin man, they know who to contact. Who's the Dom DM and who's the sub DM? Hmm. <laughs> Follow up with us. I'd like to hear if, if they got together. Our final P1 is from Jordan, last name withheld. It's to Ben and Adam. It goes like this. Bad bit moments is my favorite bit, so I wanted to share mine. 
I was applying for a job, and on my first phone interview with the recruiter, he asked, what makes you interested in applying? I said, I'm here to talk about your car's extended warranty. <laughs> there was a long pause, and he finally said, okay, and moved on. <laughs> my now boss found it hilarious. <laughs> that rules. God, I love that. That's A job interview is such a great place to do a bit. Because if they can't get on your level, yeah, yeah, it's not the job for you. You know, you hear this all the time from actors that the part that they didn't want and didn't think they would even get, or they were like down on their luck and just like had completely given up on yeah. ever having hope for a thing. They go in and, and just fucking destroyify the the audition. They're just free and loose. Yeah, I have nothing to lose. Here's here's what I think. I'm not desperate for this is the energy that is for some reason what they're looking for. I mean, that's the vibe that you should have in a lot of social interactions. Bits on recruiters yeah. is something we encourage. I would like to hear more about them. That was a very enjoyable P1. Yeah, if a, if a recruiter ever reached out to either of us ever again, I think that we would have a lot of them, but that will never happen. I don't know. According to LinkedIn, <laughs> I've missed a lot of messages. Mm. Man, is that the kind of premise walk we need to start taking for the show? Like applying for director of video production gigs at media companies? Oh, I love that idea <laughs> of being so free to just apply for video production <laughs> jobs to just like do bits on them. <laughs> I think we can make the world a better place if we free up the hiring managers for those jobs. I do too. I really do. Bring chaos to the lives of the recruiters. Yeah. Yep. That's us. Well, this has been a great P1 segment. If you would like to, uh, you know, try for some synergy, like we had something about our uh, tabletop RPG on the same episode as a professional RPG map designer, you know, go for it, man. Yeah. Or lady or NB. Maybe someday I'll be invited to play an RPG. I look forward to it. Yeah. Well, you know, you have a... A monthly poker game with like Hollywood script writers yeah. that get nominated for Oscars and shit, and I've never gotten an invite to that, so we'll see. I've got that, and I've got a house that fills with poison gas routinely, so <laughs> <laughs> so I get it. Uh, it's maximumfun.org slash jumbotron if you would like to get involved. Now at a thousand parts per million in the CO2 department, Ben. Hell yeah. Did you find yourself a drunk Shimoda? Incredible. Drunk Shimoda! Aside from myself, mm. how can I not give it to Katai? Katai is having the most fun in this episode. Katai wants to be here. Uniquely. Do you think Katai is often mistaken for Takai, mm. the, the Klingon warrior? <laughs> At least he's not mistaken for Takei. <laughs> <laughs> no one would ever confuse him for me. <laughs> not enough leather. <laughs> ben, my drunk Shimoda is going to be uh, Naomi Wildman. Wow. For that scene where Seven teaches her, she's like, look, Naomi, when this little flashing thing flashes, you got to hit the buttons in this order. Are you looking? Look, here's yeah. the pattern. And Naomi looks away during this scene. Did you watch this? <laughs> Naomi does that. not pay attention to the order of the button pushes. Kind of a lot of pressure put on Naomi Wildman to get this right. And she just, she can't even fucking pay attention long enough to get this. And then Seven puts a marshmallow on a plate and she's like, <laughs> all right, I'm going to go over here. And if you can remember this button sequence and not eat that marshmallow, I'm going to give you two marshmallows when I get back. Perfect reference. That is so funny. Hey, Ben, that's funny. Oh, thank you. I love it when people don't laugh and say that's funny. <laughs> that's funny, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so full of bubbles. Oh, burp it out, buddy. I'm trying. I'm trying to do it in a way that does not offend Wendy. Our great producer and one of the many people we've got to thank for making a show like this possible. We do. 
Wendy Uptap uh, has been our editor for over a year. Our producer editor, she fucking rules. And there are a lot of people who make our ability to hire her possible. Those are the people who go to MaximumFun.org slash join. Financial support for this show makes its professionalization possible. Yeah. Professionalization decisions like hiring a real producer, like hiring Bill Tilly, our social media manager, like going out on tour, mm-hmm. like doing things that cost money. Uh, all of those things are made possible through the generous support of the Friends of DeSoto. You can join them by going to MaximumFun.org slash join. We got to thank Adam Ragusea, who made our original theme music. We got to thank Nick Dittmore, who designed our show art. We got some great groups out there on social media. DrunkShimoto.com, Discord. Yeah, the Discord rules. GreatestGen.Wikia.com. The Wikia rules. Reddit.com. All that said, uh, we just really appreciate everybody that listens in. We love you, man. And we're not just saying that because we're drunk. It's a miracle that we get to do this as a as a job. Like, we just got drunk together for your benefit and talked about Star Trek in a way that makes me really happy, Ben. Yeah. I love doing this with you. I love doing it with you, buddy. And with that, we will be back at you next week with another great episode of Star Trek Voyager. Did I even say what the next episode is? Oh, we skipped that oh, part! Fuck, we haven't even done the game! What are we doing? We're so drunk! Oh, fuck. We're so fucked. We're so fucked. We're not, we're not going to make it to the thing we need to make it to, man. We're going to make it. We're going to okay. make it. The, right. It's it's door seven, show eight. We're going to be okay, fine. Okay, okay. Oh, I didn't know that. All Great. Right. Yeah. All right. Wait. What day does this come out? I already closed the <laughs> stupid spreadsheet. <laughs> Oh, fuck. Where are we? I tried to find it by typing spreadsheet into my browser. I'm so full of bubbles. Like, my stomach's like hard with bubbles. Oh, you're going to burp it out on the car ride over. All right. Here, after the credits, (laughs) we are reading. Is this the first ever Greatest Gen that's gone this out of order? That's fun. Hey, you know what? Stay for the credits. Yeah. That's the lesson. Yep. Uh, the next episode is season five, episode 15, Dark Frontier, part one. After defeating a Borg ship, oh! Captain Janeway decides to launch an attack on another damaged sphere to steal a transwarp coil. Where does she get the confidence? I thought we were avoiding the Borgs. <laughs> yeah. Avoiding the Borgs. A- avoid the Borgs at all costs. <laughs> yeah. That's a very Swedish chef way to put it. Avert the burg to Rokers. Sounds Swedish. You're required to learn as you play. Roll. We can't hit anything, so nope. uh, uh, we're on uh, square 36. Here I go. I rolled a four. Chula! Did I win? Hardly. We're on square 40. Hey. Regular episode next week. Good for us. This feels like a significant moment in Star Trek Voyager, right? Like, the dark frontiers? Yeah, I mean, with that, we will be back at you with another great episode of Star Trek Voyager and an episode of The Greatest Generation Voyager that hopes we have as much balls as a couple of Borg spheres. Oh, yeah. Look at them dangle. Do we get to see two spheres on screen at once? Oh, man. I'd like to see that. Do, do the Borg have a shaft design on their in their fleet? Like a whale probe from the fourth Star <laughs> Trek movie? Has a whale probe ever encountered two spheres and found it like kind of a good thing? Yeah. I think, I think that could happen. I hope that's happened. Do you think that the sphere on a Borg cube is as big as the sphere that comes out of the end of the whale probe? God, I wish we had so much more time during the tour to talk about this because no one knows the scale of the whale probe. And for a long time, like as a kid, as a dumb kid, yeah. I thought the little blue ball at the bottom was like as big as the Earth. Yeah. But who the fuck knows? No, it goes past space dock and it's like way, way bigger than space dock. No. And space dock is enormous. Yeah. And it just throws that thing to the side like it's nothing. Yeah. We, we didn't talk about that enough on tour. I wish we saw Whale Probe more in in Star Trek. Maybe that's what Picard's about. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the Shrike. Maybe Vatic is all upset about Whale Probe. <laughs> <laughs> Do people even know that name yet? I don't even know. I don't know when this comes out. Maybe. You know what? Uh... 
You may not appreciate the reference, but your kids are going to love it. They're going to love it. I can show. Hey, what a gift we are to work with. Yeah, just giving, very giving comedically. Maximumfun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned, audience supported.